While I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut That's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut I put my milkweed flavored toothpaste. Hello, Nature Nuts. How are you? Welcome back. We're on the road again, and I'll bet you'll never guess what today's episode is about. I'm here, by the way, I'll give you a hint. I'm at Natural Bridges State Beach, coastal California at Santa Cruz. That's right. We're going to do a show about butterflies. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. We've featured butterflies before on this program, but I keep getting people asking me to do a show not about any butterflies, but about the most popular butterfly of all. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the monarch, the great big orange and black migratory, magnificent milkweed butterfly, Danaeus plexippus, and this is a really neat spot for monarchs because monarchs congregate here in the winter to, uh, you know, to spend the winter, to overwinter. Not quite to hibernate, but to overwinter. I want you to know that not all orange and black butterflies are monarchs. There are actually hundreds of species of smaller orange and black butterflies, you know, in this range, that are not monarchs. So when you see an orange and black butterfly, check your field guides. A monarch is a great big thing. It's about this big in wingspan. It's the ruler, the king of butterflies. I, I, I would say queen, but there's another related species called the queen. But it's the king, it's the ruler, it's the sovereign. One moment, I gotta properly emphasize this point. The monarch. Roger, Monarch 259er, Delta Echo, Tango, Bravo, Spaghetti, you are clear for an imminent landing in an approved eucalyptus tree approximately 643 kilometers south-southeast of your present position. Over and out. You ever wonder how monarchs do it? I mean, monarchs are really amazing. They are the only North American butterfly to truly migrate. In other words, to fly north in the spring and fly south in the fall in order to uh, take advantage of the changing of the seasons. They do it in the most amazing way because the monarchs that are here on the California coast now in the winter, they will move north in the spring, then they'll lay eggs, then those eggs hatch into caterpillars that eventually become butterflies, that lay eggs themselves that become caterpillars and butterflies. And it's those butterflies, the grandchildren, that make their way back to the overwintering sites. Now, isn't that just amazing? They find the same small clump of trees that their grandparents were at without ever having been there themselves remarkable. We're learning more and more about monarch migration every year, but it's still one of the big, weird mysteries of butterfly biology. And by the way, there's a really neat book out on the subject that I have to recommend. It's called Chasing Monarchs by Robert Michael Pyle. What he did was he followed monarchs all the way down the west coast of North America and came to some really interesting conclusions about what, uh, what's going on. Let me, uh, let me show you with the aid of my trusty map of North America. Here we go. North America. I apologize for the strange shape of the United States, but this map was, after all, drawn by me, and I'm a Canadian. So here's Canada. We have monarchs along the southern edge of Canada, and here's the states, and these bumpy things are, of course, the Rocky Mountains. Now, we used to believe 
that all the monarchs from eastern North America, or east of the Rocky Mountains at least, would fly, some of them fly right over the Gulf of Mexico, right down to one little patch of trees west of Mexico City called El Rosario. We also used to believe that all the monarchs in western North America would make their way down to these groves of trees on the uh, California coast. It's a nice simple explanation and like most simple explanations in science it turns out to be flawed. Uh, most likely, and this is partly uh, as a result of the stuff that uh, Bob Pyle was doing, some of the monarchs in the west actually go down somewhere to Mexico as well. Maybe there are some big overwintering sites in Mexico that we don't know about yet. Most of the monarchs that make it uh, to these groves in California are local monarchs that come a short distance. Who knows where a monarch from southern British Columbia is going? Let's just put a big question mark there. Ah, this is fun. I feel more like a weatherman than an air traffic controller, but you get the picture. It's a weird deal, and it's very confusing, but it's wonderful, and certainly it's working well for the monarchs as long as their overwintering sites are protected. Hold on, picking up a signal here. Go ahead, Roger, this is Monarch Control. The monarch is a milkweed butterfly, part of a tropical group with only three members in North America. Hello, welcome to my study. I'm just doing a bit of sketching here, and I'd like to review with you now the lineage, the royal lineage, as we say, of the royal family of butterflies, the milkweed butterfly. The milkweed butterflies are indeed a distinguished group of Lepidoptera, the most remarkable of which is undoubtedly the monarch. And here we have a modest illustration of a monarch showing the orange and black colours, quite coincidentally the colours of William of Orange, uh, with the black outlining of the wing veins and the black outlining of the wings in general with a few little light spots. It's a lovely butterfly, but it's not the only one in the in the in the milkweed group. There is, for example, pardon me, the queen. The queen, a lovely name and a lovely butterfly, quite similar but a darker shade of orange and not as deeply outlined along the wing veins. These white spots, if you were to imagine them completely missing from this specimen, you would of course have a different species, the tropic queen. A bit of reference to the colonies, I suppose, but now we call it the soldier. And there's something to be said for standardization of these names as well, uh, so we all know exactly what we're talking about. But again, the milkweed butterfly, quite distasteful and quite wide-ranging in its own right. And then, of course, there is the Viceroy, uh, which is not a milkweed butterfly. It's not really a true blue blood, if you know what I mean. It's, a, it's an admiral, quite easily recognisable by its resemblance to either the monarch or the queen. But it has this silly little black line indicating the, uh, the fact that it's not a true milkweed butterfly, not a true member of the royal family of Lepidoptera. <laughs> I do have a bit of royal blood in my in me as well. I'm a descendant of the Victoria bird wing and the Edwards fritillary. <laughs> yes, a bit of a bit of butterfly humor there for you. <laughs> Viceroys mimic monarchs where they are more common than queens, and queens where they are more common than monarchs. Okay then, well as the grand pupa of the loyal order of loquacious Lepidoptera, I'd like to call to order right here and now this year's winter gathering of the Natural Bridges chapter of our fine society. This is of course one of approximately 20 overwintering sites for the monarch butterfly here on the coast of California, selected for our benefit by our ancestors. At one point we had 150,000 monarchs right here isn't that outstanding this year? The numbers are a bit low, down about 10, 20,000. Our goal is to catch up with El Rosario in eastern Mexico, transvolcanic ranges. They got 40 million monarchs down there. Now that's a big party. Let's try for that next year, okay? So, every one of you, you put your best into a nice smooth overwintering. And I'm going to review with you now 
Why did we choose this site? That's right, sir, you got it. Because it's close to the ocean. The ocean keeps us nice and warm. We don't like a hard killing frost. No siree, monarchs can't take it. On the other hand, it's nice to be a little bit cool here too, and it's foggy. Foggy's good, foggy brings in a little moisture in the mornings, and when you feel that moisture settling around your proboscis, you feel free to have a little sip. You know, you might think that these trees have been here forever. They certainly look like it. But I gotta tell you, these are eucalyptus trees. Are eucalyptus trees native to California? No, they are not. Firs and redwoods and all them kind of things, they're all cut down, replaced by eucalyptus. We're actually sitting around in a bunch of Australian trees, which you gotta admit is fairly peculiar. I gotta tell you though, it's a political issue. There are some people who wanna cut down these eucalyptus trees because they're not native, but I've got the word from on high that they're gonna leave the ones that we use for our overwintering pleasure. Now, isn't that good? I'd say it's excellent. Okay, so settle in. Like I say, find yourself a good cluster and uh, we'll be coming around with your registration forms in about half an hour. Meet and adjourn. <laughs> At one point, Pacific Grove had the greatest number of winter monarchs, but these have now dwindled due to development. Pum -pa -dum -pum 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 -pa! Monarch man is here. Say, did you ever notice when a monarch is flying, they don't do an awful lot of flapping. Mostly they glide. And gliding is not only fun, it's the best way to get all the way from wherever it was that you started from to your overwintering site. But when a monarch glides, it has to maintain just the right gliding angle, about one length downward, uh, yes, for every three lengths forward. In order to do that, you have to balance the weight of fat in your abdomen, not that there's any fat in my abdomen, <laughs> with the weight of water stored in your crop. Monarchs take in water and they store it in their crop, which is a big sort of a baggy part of their digestive system. Up about there, more water in the crop and you go down, less water in the crop and you go back up. Of course, they're at the mercy of the air currents to a certain amount or a certain extent. And on still days, they can't glide at all. They have to flap, which actually gets kind of tiring after a while. <laughs> well, I tell you now, it's time to start thinking about the monarch butterfly mystery a bit more clearly using the technique of a real detective. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You're mistaking me for my cousin Sherlock. My name is Jurgen Holmes. I'm his cousin. He works at Scotland Yard. I work at Stockholm Yard. But it's hard to get a lot of work these days, you know, so here I am in California doing the monarch butterfly. And what, well, you know what we're trying to figure out, right? Hey, it's the, where they come from? Where are these monarch butterflies coming from that they go in the trees, yump up there, and they all look the same, right? So how do you know where they come from? Well, you got to use detective skills. Look for clues. Not just any clues, real obvious clues. Like this, let's say you look at the monarch butterfly wing, usually attached to the rest of the monarch butterfly. This is a demonstration wing for you. And you look for the little tag. See that tag? Ho! Oh, it's got numbers on it. This one is number 68791. And a little address. It says send it to this, you know, right to these guys and they'll tell you where it came from. So if you find a monarch butterfly with a tag on it, that means somebody caught it put the tag on, let it go, it flew in away, and yump right up into the trees here. That's so easy, but there's not many tags. In fact, I have only seen one and it's not even stuck to a butterfly. So who knows if it came here, you know, in somebody's luggage or something. But there's other ways. Let me give you a hint. This is why you hire a professional detective. Look at this, what do you think that is? A glass of water, that's right. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that there is not just regular hydrogens and oxygens in there. There's also a little bit of deuterium. That's an isotope. But this is not a chemistry show. So if you want to know what an isotope is, go look it up. But I'll tell you something cool. There's deuterium in rainwater too. The rainwater comes down 
It waters the milkweed plants that grow up and in the sun. Little caterpillar chewing on them turn into a butterfly. And you catch the butterfly, take it to a big expensive lab full of gonculators, grind it up, and look at how much deuterium it's got, then you can tell what part of the world it came from. Isn't that neat? Ho! Oh, science is amazing stuff. And how about this? What's that look like to you? Poison? Yeah, that's what it is, poison. Monarch butterflies are full of poison. Cardenolide poison comes from the plants that they eat when they're caterpillars. And I'll tell you something really goofy. Different kinds of milkweeds have different kinds of cardenolides making for different kinds of poisons in the butterflies. Again, what you do, catch the butterfly, take it home, put it in the gonculator, figure out what's inside of it. Then you can say what kind of milkweed it was feeding on, where it comes from, that's how we're gonna solve this mystery. And then we'll get paid, I guess, or something. <laughs> Maybe just be famous. Took me a heck of a long time to find a guy named Watson to work with. It didn't get much work, had to lay him off. Now he works at the burger joint. It's not easy, but then you probably know that. The location of the famous Mexican overwintering site was discovered by a Canadian professor along with many, many, many butterfly tagging volunteers. There's an old man feeding pigeons at the circus. But the circus left years ago. He remembers with fondness a lady They would talk for hours after the show And the butterflies looked happy that day But in the autumn Butterflies had all gone away When spring returns, the butterflies will too Will she fly back to him someday? I'll hold you Lazy summer days will also end But when they come back It fills me with hope Keeps a program in his pocket from years ago. A lady walking by said she likes butterflies. Could it be that this is she? The butterflies agree. I've kept you right here in my memory. I'm glad that you finally come home These lazy summer days must also end But I'm glad I won't see them
Well, it's a lovely day, isn't it, to be among the royalty of butterflies, the monarchs themselves. That's the way I look at it, really. Yes, it's very nice to be here in the wintering ground with the butterflies. Yes, you know, it really brings to mind, to me at least, the brilliant synthesis that was achieved by Professor Bates with respect to the, the phenomenon of mimicry, the monarch and the viceroy, are the quintessential example of Batesian mimicry, wherein, I might add, the Viceroy is a perfectly palatable butterfly. A bird eats it and nothing happens. It eats a monarch and it throws up violently. And of course, Professor Bates was insightful enough to recognize that the monarch was, was the, the model and the Viceroy was the mimic and the monarch is more common than the Viceroy and the Viceroy gains this protection by looking like it's distasteful, non-relative. It's a brilliant theory, and Professor Bates should be commended for this grand synthesis of natural history knowledge. Oh, yes, the theory is fine so far as it goes, but you must admit it's a bit simple-minded. It was a good start, but Professor Mueller is the one who has truly synthesized the theory of the mimicry in the butterflies by demonstrating that the monarch and the viceroy are both mimicking each other because birds are not very smart. Birds are very stupid. They can only remember one pattern, not two. And actually, the viceroy, it sometimes tastes bad too. You know that. It is a complex thing. It reflects the complexity of nature and the ability of Mueller's fascinating intellect to comprehend all of that complexity. But I really think that the simplicity is, is in essence, the, the brilliance of the whole thing. The burden of proof rests on the least parsimonious hypothesis, wouldn't you say? Well, I don't think at all. I think that it is a much more complex situation and we must respect the superior intellect of Professor Mueller. <laughs> is that so? Well, all I can say to that is checkmate. What do you mean, checkmate? What rule book are you going by? Ah, there's nothing quite as beautiful as a blushing bride beside the briny deep. Don't you think? It's a good thing I shaved this morning. Before we go, I've got to talk to you a little bit about the practice of releasing monarch butterflies at weddings. Now, in some ways, it's kind of a nice thing. Butterflies are beautiful. They're symbols of joy and freedom and hope and all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, I can see why people would want to let monarchs go and have them flutter up into the sky while they're getting married. But there are also good reasons not to let monarchs go at your wedding. I know you've heard of mail order brides. Well, these are mail order monarchs. They are shipped to whoever does your wedding from other parts of the continent. And what that means is that, first of all, they can, uh, they can interbreed with the local monarchs and mess up the genetics of the local population. They could also spread diseases to the local monarchs. And worst of all, in my opinion, for those people who are trying to understand the mystery of monarch migration, all these wedding monarchs are messing up the picture because they don't know where to migrate. They don't know where they're going. Most of them don't even survive. The worst thing you can do is get married on a rainy day. You open your monarch box and they all flop around on the ground because they're too cold. They can't fly. That's a downer. You don't want to start your marriage that way. If you want to throw things, throw rice. Lots of rice. It's cheap, easy to get. Easy to sweep up, easy to get out of your clothes. And if you want something that will soar up into the air in a majestic fashion, throw balloons. I like balloons and I like butterflies. That's why I'm a nature nut. Hope you are too. See you again soon. Ready girls, here she comes. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>